Have you ever questioned whether or not antibiotics are being used properly? Well then, you've come to the right place. In recent years, there has been an increased tendency to prescribe oral antibiotics to treat several oral health concerns. Recent studies have shown that using antibiotics in the pediatric population should be limited to circumstances that pose a significant threat to the systemic health. In order to limit the negative outcomes followed by inappropriate use of these drugs, antibiotic therapy should be used in a smaller number of pediatric oral infections than originally assumed. Let's dive in a little deeper to this issue so that we can capture the full picture. Let's start by defining a few of the more common types of oral infections that present in both the pediatric and adult population. First and foremost, what is an odontogenic infection? Odontogenic infections are defined as infections of dental tissue origin. They are most prevalent and are usually self-limiting infections in children and adolescents. Most odontogenic infections are contained to a localized area and do not warrant the use of antibiotics for treatment. However, when these bacteria replicate, their tendency is to put up a fight and spread. In these cases, we might see things like fever, facial swelling, redness, and pain, telling us that there is now systemic invasion and our patient is at high risk. The gingival abscess is a common dental emergency. It can be described as a localized, acute accumulation of bacteria, or pus, in a gingival sulcus, which can result in periodontal tissue damage. It is often caused by a foreign body impaction, commonly by foods such as seeds, nuts, and popcorn kernels. A related, but very different, dental infection is known as a periodontal abscess. <laughs> These infections involve the bacterial spread beyond the gingival sulcus, often seen in patients with periodontal disease. This disease process is chronic in nature and involves bone destruction, which can ultimately result in the loss of teeth. Although there are many odontogenic infections in nature, for this video, we are going to focus on the one that presents in offices with high frequency and is often difficult to treat. This is known as the periapical abscess. The periapical abscess is an acute inflammatory condition. It is associated with pulpal necrosis, in other words, a dead tooth. When the internal dentinal tissue dies, it results in bacterial invasion. These bacteria then make their way down the path of least resistance and exit the tooth at the apex, where an opening exists to the rest of the body. When the bacteria exit, it results in a dark shadow or radiolucency that can be detected with x-ray technology. These infections have the propensity to spread further and cause systemic infections, but with early detection and diagnosis, appropriate treatment can be rendered to prevent this from happening. When these infections progress and go untreated, there is often a triad of pathological, social, and economical consequences. Most obvious are the pathological consequences. These can be as minor as affecting only the single infected tooth, but can easily progress to the rest of the body. Locally, we often see root resorption, tooth loss, and devastating effects to the unerupted permanent teeth. The infections can also progress to the formation of cysts, bone metastasis, and at the most extreme, manifestations such as Ludwig's angina, and a cavernous sinus thrombosis, which can be life-threatening situations. Leaving these infections untreated inevitably leads to social pitfalls like children missing school and activities, and of course, the psychological burden of pain. As demonstrated, untreated infections become more problematic as time goes on, and usually result in a trip to the emergency room. With that, this increases the cost of treatment, creating a significant financial barrier to many patients. To keep the extent of these consequences to a minimal, it is important that these patients are well informed and advised to make appropriate decisions in a timely manner. Now that you have an understanding of what these infections are and why they tend to cause problems, we must address how we go about treating them. The key to using antibiotic therapy in any situation is to know what you're up against. Most antibiotics are prescribed using empirical evidence. In other words, choosing an antibiotic based off of which microorganism is likely causing the infection. So what does this mean exactly? Microorganisms can be categorized in a number of ways one of which is based off of their oxygen requirements. First, there's the anaerobes, who can survive in areas only where oxygen is absent. On the other hand, there's the aerobes. Aerobes need oxygen, similar to humans. And then there are the facultative anaerobes, who have the unique ability to survive with or without oxygen. Having this info can certainly help influence our decision when choosing an antibiotic, but it is simply just piece of the pie. Two of the most common classes of antibiotics used in dentistry can be described as the cell wall synthesis inhibitors and the protein synthesis inhibitors. In 1927, there was a revolutionary breakthrough when Alexander Fleming discovered penicillin, the world's first antibiotic. Since then, there have been subsequent generations of penicillins as well as the cephalosporins, which behave in a similar way. These antibiotics act on the cell wall synthesis machinery of the invading microorganism and ultimately lead to a lytic cell death. 
These antibiotics use an attack mechanism through the utilization of a beta-lactam ring. This ring acts by directly inhibiting the cross-linking ability of the peptidoglycan chains that comprise the majority of the bacterial cell wall. These antibiotics are considered to be bactericidal. Their actions directly result in the bacterial elimination or death. The problem with these antibiotics is that some of the bacteria have responded to the relentless actions of these drugs and have naturally selected for a defense mechanism of their own. This is known as antibiotic resistance. So-called resistant bacteria have manipulated their genetic code in such a way that has resulted in the production of a beta-lactamase enzyme. In a sense, this enzyme is secreted by the infective bacteria and neutralizes the antibiotic attack due to its affinity for the beta-lactam ring. Our response? Augmentin. Augmentin combats this defense mechanism by combining traditional amoxicillin with clavonic acid, which acts to suppress the effects of the enzyme beta-lactamase. On the other end of the spectrum, we have the protein synthesis inhibitors. The protein synthesis inhibitors behave in a different way and are considered bacteriostatic in nature. This time, the target is the ribosome. The action dismantles the metabolic process of the invading microorganisms, which alter its ability to reproduce and survive. However, it is ultimately the host's immune system that eliminates these targeted bacteria. These antibiotics are known as clindamycin, erythromycin, tetracycline, and azithromycin. In addition to the pharmacodynamics of antibiotics, it is also important to know that there are additional factors that play a role in the efficacy of these drugs. Minimum inhibitory concentration, which is the smallest amount of drug that produces a visible stoppage in the growth of bacteria. Pharmacokinetics, which describes how these drugs get transported throughout the body and end up at the infectious site. Though these concepts are very important, we will not be going into detail for it goes beyond the scope of this video. Just know that these factors may not be consistent from person to person, and definitely not between adults and children. By now, you might be wondering, when do we actually use these things? According to the American Academy of Pediatric Dentistry, first-line treatment for teeth with periapical infection should be removal of the source of infection using local and operative measures. These include procedures such as pulpotomy, pulpectomy, or extraction. We'll get into these later. The key point is that systemic antibiotics are currently only recommended for situations where there is evidence of systemic involvement. Along with that, antibiotics should never be used independently to treat any type of odontogenic infection. Though antibiotics are generally well tolerated, inexpensive, and can be life-saving, it is important to understand that there are a number of side effects. We will discuss a few of them. First, let's take a look at how these drugs affect the GI tract. Short-term treatment with antibiotics can shift the gut microflora to create a long-term microbial disbalance. Patients may exhibit stomach pain, digestive problems, and loss of appetite. This disbalance can also be responsible for the development of disease and aggravation of existing disease. One disease common to administration of clindamycin is known as C. diff, or uncontrolled diarrhea. Another detrimental side effect to watch out for is tetracycline staining. These antibiotics have a rather high affinity for mineralizing tissue and possess the unique ability to penetrate into uncalcified teeth, cartilage, and bone. In the long run, this can cause severe brownish to grayish staining of a child's primary and permanent dentition. It is recommended to not prescribe this drug to any child under the age of 8, as well as any pregnant mother, as the drug possesses the ability to cross the placenta and reach the fetus. Keeping the side effects in mind, one can prescribe antibiotics safely and be prepared to deal with issues when they arise. As we just mentioned, treating most infections does not begin with the administration of antibiotics. We must first eliminate the source of infection utilizing local and operative procedures. This often involves pulpotomy, pulpectomy, and extraction procedures. After a proper pulpal diagnosis is obtained, a treatment plan may be presented to the patient containing one, two, or all three of these options. A pulpotomy is a dental procedure of which the coronal pulp tissue is removed. The pulp tissue extending into the roots is left as is, provided that the dental infection was limited to the crown of the tooth. When the infection is not caught early, it can progress to the radicular pulp tissue, indicating a pulpectomy. Like a pulpotomy, a pulpectomy involves removal of the coronal pulp tissue, but also includes the removal of the pulpal tissue extending into the roots. Both a pulpotomy and a pulpectomy are effective methods in the elimination of the infection, but also must be followed up with a stainless steel crown in order to preserve the space in the given arch. Oftentimes, the infection has compromised the tooth beyond its ability to be restored. In these cases, an extraction is often necessary to rid the infectious tissue. An extraction may also be necessary if a previous pulpotomy or pulpectomy fails to resolve the issue. In order to beat any infection, it is imperative that we first eliminate the source. By doing this, there will be nothing left for the infection to live off of, as the body's immune system should be able to fight off any remaining bacteria. Alright, time to bring this all together. Let's sum this up in three points. Point number one. 
Many dentists and pediatric dentists fail to follow a true antibiotic protocol, which in turn has resulted in the overprescribing habits of many providers. It is critical that all providers understand and follow the recommendations put forth by the ADA as well as the AAPD in order to treat all patients in compliance with the standard of care. Point number two, not all odontogenic infections are indicative of antibiotic use. With a thorough understanding of the etiology, microbiology, and pathogenesis of these infections, in addition to the pharmacologic behavior of the drugs, effective treatment with antibiotics can be used as an adjunct to traditional dental procedures. Point number three, as both humans and microorganisms continue to evolve, antibiotic resistance is inevitable. However, by making educated, clinical, and pharmacological decisions, the dental provider can actively help to slow this progress and increase the efficacy of proper antibiotic therapy. Thanks.